Hello, this is EOC Review Part 3. We're going to cover the what I used to call U.S. expansionism, a time period in the early 1900s, late 1800s, but the, the state is calling it rise of a world power, so okay, and World War I. So, and I'm, I'm going to try to stick to only what's on the EOC. Um, I'm not going to leave a lot of stuff out, but I am going to, you know, be going a little bit faster than I would normally go during a normal school year. So let's get started. Okay, so you need to know time periods or eras in U.S. history. So you know the progressive era, you know the Gilded Age, you know westward expansion. Here's another one, U.S. rise of a world power also called expansionism. It's a time when the United States played a greater role in, world, in the world and they became more imperialistic, meaning they're gonna expand the American empire just beyond the borders of California, but into the Pacific Ocean and down to the Panama Canal. Okay, I've seen this every couple of years. <clears throat> there was a guy in the late 1800s, his name is Alfred Thayer Mahan, and he wrote a book, a very convincing book. And the book, there's a picture of it in the upper right-hand corner, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History. Okay? And so what he did in this book is he convinced the right people in the American government of this. If the United States is going to be a big world power one day, like the English, for example, we're going to have to do the same thing that the English did and the Spanish did back in the 1500s is we need a Navy. <clears throat> we need a powerful Navy. Okay. And so as a result, that's what happened. The United States, you know, with the 16th amendment, you know, now that we have the government has some money, now they can build their Navy and become a world power. So to show off the Navy, the United States sailed this fleet around the world. It was called the Great White Fleet. And, you know, we didn't get into any major wars during this time, but it was kind of like America strutting its stuff. So Alfred Thayer Mahan, naval power. I always think of a belly button, you know, like belly button power, naval power, or sea power. So here we go. Alfred Thayer Mahan supported moving the United States into a position of power by doing what? Okay, hit pause if you need to. The answer is naval capacity, belly button power, naval power. Okay, all right, moving on. Okay, I have seen the Spanish-American War on the test many times. Um, the Span you need to have this date memorized, and you need to know what caused the Spanish-American War. Uh, there was a ship called the USS Maine that exploded. And, um, and I'll tell you more about in a second. And then yellow journalism, tabloids. I haven't seen that on the EOC, but I'm going to teach it to you real quick. <clears throat> okay. All right, so here's the story. Cuba and Puerto Rico were part of the Spanish Empire, you know, Spain. The residents were beginning to revolt against Spanish rule. So Spain was down there in Cuba and Puerto Rico dealing with insurgents, okay? And the United States was very interested in paying attention to what was going on down there. The United States was interested in sugar plantations. Now, if you're thinking, well, what do we need so much sugar for? Well, there's a lot of money in sugar. Not only do you need to sweeten your stuff, but you make rum from sugar, okay? The United States sent a warship to Havana Harbor called the USS Maine. Anytime you see the USS in front of something, it's a ship. Okay, why did they do it? It was to basically, it was a power play. It was to show the Spanish, we're watching, okay? Well, one night, out of nowhere, boom! It just exploded, okay? Now, that's the facts, it exploded. So what happened as a result? Well, the newspapers, as our dear president would call fake news, they blew this out of proportion, okay? And, and they sensationalized this main explosion. And look at this, it says, main explosion caused by bomb or torpedo. Well, that's a loaded headline. Well, what if it was neither? 
Okay, that's a, that's a loaded headline to get people to buy newspapers. It's kind of like an internet site that's try that phrases the headline in a way to get you to click on it because that generates ad money. Yellow journalism is the same thing. Crisis is at hand. Well, maybe it's not at hand. Maybe there is no crisis. Spanish treachery. Maybe there is no Spanish treachery. Okay? And, and by the way, we have got to fight, must declare for war. Why would the New York Journal want war? Because it sells more newspapers. Okay? And it's called yellow journalism because the paper was published on such poor quality that it would turn yellow by mid-afternoon. Okay, that's why it's called yellow journalism. All right, and by the way, what really happened? Well, a about 20 years ago, they dug up the USS Maine and they noticed that the explosion faced outward from the hull. That means that the explosion was internal, not external. So we don't think nowadays that Spain had anything to do with this, okay? <clears throat> By the way, modern day yellow journalism would be like tabloids, okay? I'm not saying that Newsweek is a tabloid, but that is, but that headline is very provocative and Newsweek is getting there, okay? Okay, you know, yellow journalism, okay? All right, so let me ask you this. Think back to this. How are yellow journalists different from muckrakers? Okay, think about that. Yellow journalists just want to do what? They want to sell newspapers. Muckrakers, they want to make the world a better place. Okay? So the Spanish-American War was fought. It was a very quick war. It only lasted a few months. As a result of the Spanish-American War, the United States gained three territories. And we own these territories, or we... Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippine Islands. <clears throat> Cuba, we did not own, but we took them on as a protectorate. So basically, we were bullying them, and we put a Navy base there called Guantanamo Bay. But, um, but we never owned Cuba, but we sure acted like we owned Cuba. There's a lot of tobacco and sugar plantations that the United States was interested in. Just 50 years later, the mobsters are going to have casinos in Cuba, okay? So, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippine Islands, okay? By the way, look at all of these other territories that the United States gained during this time. So, anytime you see a date, the United States gained that territory. Hawaii, 1898. Um, American Samoa, Howard Island, Johnson Island, Midway Island, Wake Island, Alaska. All right, so my point is, is that during this time, the United States has gained a world empire. I mean, it's, it stretches all the way to China, okay? And that's good, because if we ever wanted to trade with China, then our ships would have places to stop for food and partying and, and fuel and stuff. Again, what are the three territories we gained from the Spanish-American War? Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines, okay? And we are going to own the Philippines until the end of World War II. And Puerto Rico, they are still American citizens, okay? They, they are not a state, but they are American citizens. So if you ever want to go on a vacation to Puerto Rico, you do not need a passport. You can just go. All right, so what are the effects of the Spanish-American War? We got Puerto Rico, Guam, and Philippines. It stimulated sugar production and U.S. industry. Also, the United States decided to build the Panama Canal. So, and it'll be finished by about the year 1914, 1915, the Panama Canal. All right, so look at this old EOC question. We've got a question mark. We've got the same question mark, so it's the cause and the effect. U.S. control of Philippines, Cuban independence, U.S. control of Puerto Rico, U.S. control of Guam. What is the answer here? Hit pause. 
And the answer is 1898 Spanish-American War. Okay? That's a bit of an exaggerated answer, but still. It was the first time the United States beat a European power in a war. The Spanish, we beat them. They had wooden ships, we had metal ships. It was real easy. All right. Which statement would most likely be found in a history of the economic impact of the Spanish-American War on the United States? Is it statement one, two, three, or four? Hit pause, this is a typical EOC question. So look for something, look for an economic impact and look for one that has to do with the Spanish-American War. The answer is that. All right, we've got a question mark at the top. Residents granted U.S. citizenship in 1917. Governors have been elected by popular vote since 48. Adopted both the Constitution and Commonwealth status in 52. Which of the following <clears throat> best replaces the question mark in this list of information about Puerto Rico? And the answer is B. Teddy Roosevelt. That's actually how his name is said, but we always say Roosevelt, but it's Roosevelt. Not only did he bust up trust and create a national park system, he began to assert America's power in the world, especially in the Caribbean and Central America. So look at this. You got Teddy Roosevelt pointing a gun at Europe. You see where it says Europe? At Europe. And what Teddy Roosevelt is saying, Europeans, stay out of the Caribbean. Any, if there are any problems with the Caribbean, we, the United States, will handle it. This is our turf. Okay. So here's a cartoon depicting Teddy Roosevelt as the world's police. It says at the bottom, the world's constable. Constable is, a, is an old term for policeman. So you got Europeans over here shouting things over here at the at at, um, at these Caribbeans, and look at that the new diplomacy, Teddy Roosevelt's big stick diplomacy. Basically, he wanted the United States to be a world power, and he and you know and so you got the big new navy. He wanted America to be a world power. Okay. During this time period, because of the Spanish-American War, see, the Spanish-American War was fought right here in the Caribbean. We had some ships over here in San Francisco to go fight the Spanish-American War, but it took them forever to go around South America. So the United States went down here. And there was no country of Panama at the time. It was called Northern Colombia. And there were these rebels called Panamanian rebels that were fighting against the Colombians. The United States goes down there, helps the Panamanians. We help them declare independence from Colombia. And the first thing that the Panamanians do is grant the United States access and ownership of the Panama Canal. And the United States owned the Panama Canal until 1999. So that's the United States bullying Central America and South America. So the Panama Canal isn't very wide, but it's wide enough for two ships to go across it. Okay? It even brings your ships up, and then it brings it down. So it's filling the water, then the ship goes forward, the doors close behind it, fills it up with water again, and then it goes forward. All right, so this was the main reason why Americans wanted the Panama Canal built. Remember, technology such as a canal makes everything faster, cheaper, more efficient. So in this case, it makes travel faster, cheaper, more efficient. 
Here's an EOC question. Which outcome was an important effect of the 1898 event illustrated by this map? So this is basically what I just told you a minute ago. Departed San Francisco in March, arrived in May. So what is a result of what you saw in this map? The answer is B. Increase public support for the construction of a canal through Central America. This cartoon comments on tactics used to what? So you got Teddy Roosevelt, the big stick, and look at here. The answer is D. What was the main effect of the changes shown on this graph on the Western United States? It's a little fuzzy, sorry. Differences in maritime, mar, sea, maritime, shipping distances before and after the Panama Canal opened. So the, the light gray bar is via Panama Canal. That means by way of Panama Canal. The dark bar is via Magellan Straits. The Magellan Straits is down here. That's the Magellan Straits, down here, which is very dangerous and very bumpy road down there. Not a road, but a sea path. As you can see by the Panama Canal, it's a lot shorter. Liverpool to San Francisco. Liverpool is in England. So from Liverpool to San Francisco, it's much shorter to go through the Panama Canal. From New York to San Francisco, it's much shorter to go through the Panama Canal. Hit pause, do the question. And the answer is, remember technology makes everything faster, cheaper, more efficient more efficient. I haven't seen him on the EOC before, but Sanford Dole, he basically helped the United States steal Hawaii. Hawaii was an independent nation with a queen and everything, and this guy wanted to make money selling pineapples. He convinced the United States to steal Hawaii. Sanford B. Dole is remembered for having expanded U.S. power by Hawaii. Summary. This time period coexisted with progressivism. The United States is no longer isolationist. They are expanding their empire with new territories. Know the causes and effects of the Spanish-American War and the date. When was the Spanish-American War? 1898. What territories did we get? Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. Okay. How did it affect our economy? More sugar production. Okay. Now, moving on to World War I. You need to know when it was. You need to know what caused the war to start. You need to know why we got involved. You need to know some important people in one important battle. Okay, this is an American history class, so we're going to focus on America. At least we're going to try to, okay? When was World War I? It was in the teens. So if you see a political cartoon and the political cartoon says 1917 on it, then you know they're talking about World War I. It ended in 1918, which we call Armistice Day. Okay, what are the causes of World War I? Think of the word mania, militarism, alliances, nationalism, imperialism, and assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Okay, so militarism, military, milita, you know, everyone had weapons and they were real eager to use them. Entangled alliances. Think about it. It's like if some dude you know gets in a fight and you feel bound to fight with him because he's your friend, 
even though you think he's being a dumbass right now, you still like you you still feel like you have to fight with him. That's kind of the way half of Europe was. France fought because uh, Russia got involved. Germany fought because Austria got involved. Everybody fought because somebody else was getting involved. So this war is one of the stupidest wars ever fought in the world history. So if you look at this cartoon, you can see about the alliances. Imperialism, building your empire. If you change the letter I into the letter E, you get something that looks like empire. Basically, everybody in Europe knew that if they won this war, they could take the African colonies. So Germany fought France, knowing that if France loses, that Germany could take over all of these colonies and then rape the land of natural resources. Nationalism. Nationalism is a lot like school spirit, but it's for countries instead. You know how people like America, that's nationalism. Right or wrong, it's my country. Well, that's how Germany was. That's how Serbia was. So nationalism, somebody's like, let's go off a cliff and then everybody follows them. This poster is Canadian nationalism. Go fight for Can Canada's honor. Okay. And then the assassination of the Archduke Francis Ferdinand and his wife. He was assassinated by an 18-year-old terrorist from Serbia. Just boom! Normally that event would not start a world war in which 30 million people were killed. But what happened was is this, okay? Here's Serbia, and that prince that got shot was from Austria, okay? So Austria's like, I'm gonna get you, Serbia. You know, you killed our prince. And then the Russians are like, hey, man, don't mess with my Serbia. And then the Germans are like, hey, Russians, don't you mess with Austria. And then the French are like, hey, Germany, don't talk, don't talk to Serbia like that. And the British are like, can we all just get along and have a cup of tea? Anyway, you notice America isn't involved yet. They won't get involved until 1917, near the end of 1917. Okay. All right. World War I technologies, trench warfare, and understand that it's easier to defend a trench than it is to attack a trench. That's why so many millions of men died in this war pointlessly with nothing to show for it. Machine guns go along with trenches and barbed wire, poison gas, airplanes, submarines, and tanks. Those are all new for World War I. Oh, and shotguns were used a lot in World War I, I heard, too. Pissed off a lot of Germans when the Americans showed up with these shotguns. Okay. All right. This map best represents which cause of World War I. Look at the title. European colonization? The best answer is imperialism. Some students say nationalism, but I think imperialism is better because Africa was just there for the Europeans to just take over. This was on the EOC. Which of the following is the best title for this list? Okay, read the list. Militarism, political interference in the unstable Balkan Peninsula. What is the Balkan Peninsula? I'll show you. The Balkan Peninsula is this area right here. That's the Balkan Peninsula. Okay. Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. Okay, so this has nothing to do with World War II. It has to do with World War I. Remember, after World War I, the Ottoman Empire disappeared. They became what we call the Middle East. So if you see the Ottoman Empire, you know it's not talking about World War II. So while this was going on, 
President Woodrow Wilson, and he maintained that the United States needs to be neutral in this war. Some tests say isolationist, so just be ready for either one, but technically in World War I, we were not, we were neutral. Okay, we weren't isolationists. We were actually selling weapons to both sides in the war, making lots of money. Okay, we were not isolationists. We were neutral, though. We, had, we didn't take sides, and we shouldn't have taken sides. The Germans were, you know, just as at fault as anyone else. So here's a cartoon of Woodrow Wilson steering clear of the rocks. He's trying to avoid war. He's trying to avoid intervention. He's trying to follow the light of justice. Okay? So why did the United States enter World War I? Two reasons. Because of unrestricted submarine warfare. The Germans were sinking our ships. This looks like the Titanic, but it was actually the Lusitania. The Germans shot torpedoes at this ship um, women and children were killed, even some celebrities were killed, and it made the United States mad. You don't shoot torpedoes at a passenger ship. But you know what? There were weapons on that ship, so the Germans were right in sinking it. A submarine shot that ship. The Germans had submarines, and they were called U-boats. Another reason why, and this, the, this made us mad, the Germans sent a secret telegram to Mexico, and they said, hey, Mexicans, we're Germans. If you declare war against the United States and keep them out of this war, we will create, make an alliance with you Mexicans, and we will win this war, and we will help you Mexicans get back all the land that you lost to the United States. Okay, so we'll give you back Arizona, New Mexico, California, Texas. The Mexicans denied ever receiving this telegram, but the Americans, it obviously, it, it really upset American nationalism to hear that Germany tried to pull this over on the United States. So as a result of this Zimmerman telegram and as a result of sinking our ships, the United States entered World War I in 1917. All right, so let's try this. The key factor in the U.S. decision to enter World War I was what? All right, hit pause if you need to. The answer is unrestricted submarine warfare. Okay. How did the Zimmerman telegram influence U.S. history into World War I? Okay, the answer is proposed military alliance between Mexico and Germany. Why did the United States decide to enter World War I? The answer is, hit pause if you need to, B. A European nation, Germany, had decided, had taken aggressive actions against the United States, such as sinking our ships and proposing a military alliance with Mexico. This cartoon depicts President Woodrow Wilson calling on Congress to do what? Okay, I don't see much here, but look here. American ships sunk without warning, American lives lost. So the answer must be B, declare war. All right. So another thing, um, the Selective Service Act, it's the draft. When, when men turn 18, you have to go to the post office and you have to sign up for the Selective Service Act. Just in case we ever have a war, and you need to be drafted to go fight in that war. We haven't had any drafts since the Vietnam War, 
but you still got to do it when you turn 18. Just don't think about it, just do it. All right, that's what the service, Selective Service Act is. So upon entering World War I, the United States enlarged its military by passing the Selective Service Act. If you looked at the GI Bill and was tempted, that's, you're thinking World War II. And the GI Bill, that was a benefits program for veterans, not to get them into the Army. Trench warfare produced a stalemate. What's a stalemate? It's a war where nobody's winning. Stalemate is like it's a tied game. Nobody's winning, nobody's losing. Because they were much easier to defend than they were to attack. Because of the machine guns protecting the trenches and the barbed wire made of steel, barbed wire was made of steel, Andrew Carnegie, uh, the war was tough. Okay. Flamethrowers. How do you successfully get through the machine guns and the barbed wire? Tanks. That's what tanks were built for, is to get through the barbed wire and to get through the machine guns. This photograph shows a military tactic that, what? The answer is, hit pause, the answer is C. Okay, produce the stalemate, made frontal assaults difficult. How did the military innovation, invention, innovation shown in this photograph affect the course of World War one. So it's not A, they're not very big. You can see people in that photograph. Tanks are not that big. Okay, it's not about communication. The answer is B. It helped break the stalemate of trench warfare. During World War I, tanks were used on the Western Front primarily to do what? The answer is A. No man's land is the space between the enemy trenches and our own trenches. And the no man's land is where you, you know, no, everybody died. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's where, you know, hardly anybody survived no man's land. And so the troops would just get behind the tanks and walk behind the tanks. All right, so flamethrowers, grenade launchers. What caused the scene described in this excerpt? Hit pause, read it. The smoke and fumes hid everything from sight and hundreds of men were thrown into a comatose or dying condition. And within an hour, the whole position had to be abandoned together with about 50 guns. 1915, so that tells you that this is about World War I. The answer is... Poison gas, mustard gas, chlorine gas. I don't like this question, but let's look at it. So always read the title, Warfare During the First World War. Your answer goes here, combined with soldiers dug trenches. Your answer plus this leads to a stalemate developed along the Western Front. So we're not trying to break the stalemate. That would be B, so it's not B. The answer is C, okay? So machine guns and trenches combine to create a stalemate. The tanks will break it. Again, that's a tricky question. Okay. I think, I'm pretty sure the answer is A. Uh, this is just a poster talking about, um, like, we need you to come work for us because we need to build ships for the war, okay? All right, the Espionage Act. During World War I, the government passed a law that says it was illegal to criticize the government during the war. And that's kind of crazy because we have the First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, but, uh, but anyway, they, they got rid of that for the First World War. 
and threw some people in jail for running their mouths, okay? 6,000 Americans were arrested under the Espionage Act. And here's some women protesting the Espionage Act, okay? So look at this cartoon, this 1917 illustration. So when you see that year, you know that this is World War I, because when you're taking the EOC, you don't know what the subject is. When you see that year, you know that they're talking about World War I here. It was published as a commentary on a proposed piece of legislation. Which of the following best replaces the question mark in the illustration? So we want something that makes liberty sad. And the answer is the Espionage Act. Okay. Whoever, when the United States is at war, shall willfully utter, print, write, or publish any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the form of government of the United States shall be punished by a fine of not more than $10,000 or imprisonment for not more than 20 years or both. Espionage Act, May of 1918. This law demonstrates that at one time the federal government was willing to... The answer is suspend freedom of speech. Okay. Um, I've never seen him on the test, I don't think, but the famous general of the Americans was John J. Pershing. And he was the famous general of the American Expeditionary Forces. So when you see that American Expeditionary Forces, that's what the army was called. And one thing he's known for is holding back the American troops long enough to make sure that they got months of training. The Germans, the British were like, send the Americans over here. And Pershing's like, we're not ready. We're not ready. This led to fewer deaths and, and the love and respect of his men. Okay. The only battle that you need to know about is Argonne Forest. I don't think I've seen it on the test, but think of it as a turning point battle in World War I. So what was one effect of the arrival of the American expeditionary forces in Europe during World War I? And there you go. Okay. All right. Argonne Forest, that dog won some medals. A lot of people did. Uh, Alvin York, uh, I don't want to get into it much, but he won the Medal of Honor during World War I by single-handedly killing 25 Germans and capturing 132 prisoners of war. This guy was a badass. Alvin York. Okay. General John J. Pershing made a major contribution to the Allied victory in World War I by doing what? Okay. All right. All right, here's some propaganda posters. Liberty Gardens. Women were asked to grow gardens to help with the vegetables because we were afraid that all the farm boys went to fight in the war. Okay. Uh, remember, liberty bonds is what people was what was used to finance the war. Just like war bonds, liberty bonds, same thing. Loan your money to pay for the war. Okay. This World War I era poster was intended to persuade what? Liberty bonds to help people for people to help finance the war. Finance the war. Okay. The war ended on 1918. Today we celebrate that as Veterans Day. It's called Armistice Day. It's an agreement to stop fighting, November 11th, 1918. All right, I'm, I need to finish. Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. This was a list of things that Woodrow Wilson said that we need to do to prevent another war. We need to stop taking over Africa, we need to stop building our militaries, we need to stop having secret alliances, and also we need a League of Nations, a League of Nations. It's an organization where countries can come together and work out their problems, okay? Did it work? Obviously not, because we had World War II, okay? 
absolute freedom of navigation upon the seas outside territorial waters alike in peace and in war, except as the seas may be closed in whole or in part by an international action for the enforcement of international covenants. What is Woodrow Wilson talking about in this 14 points? He's talking about blockades and unrestricted submarine warfare. Okay, sorry I rushed that one. Okay. So the League of Nations meant well. It was supposed to prevent another major war, but obviously it failed because Hitler ignored it in World War II. So did the Japanese. But it had a good intention. It was supposed to be everyone just works out their problems. Why was the League of Nations a failure? Well, they had no world army, no enforcement power, and the United States didn't enjoy. They did not join the League of Nations. The United States went back into isolationism. And the United States just didn't want to get involved anymore. So it weakened it. So one reason the League of Nations failed as a world organization, the answer is B, no power to enforce anything. The Treaty of Versailles ended World War I. It blamed and humiliated Germany. I'm gonna get into that in the next one because Loom limits me to 45 minutes, okay? So, all right.